So my name is Jackie Wallace. I'm CEO of Genius Within and I have got with me today some awesome speakers um, from our dyslexia community and um, I'd like to just very briefly introduce them. So we've got Marcia Brissett Bailey, a great friend of Genius Within. Um, we have got Annabelle Southcote, who is a non-exec director of Genius um, and all-round amazing lady. Uh, Tim too. We haven't met before today personally, but we had a brief chat beforehand. Uh, tech entrepreneur, creative, ADHD coach, awesome individual also. And Remy. Remy Ray is on our um, panel as well. We've had a slight technical hitch with the background uh, for Remy. So um, she's either invisible or without a background. So we chose without a background because we want to see her face. And um, last but definitely not least, Dr. Nancy Doyle, um, who is our, we've had a little shift around at the top now, our Chief Research Officer and founder of Genius Within. Um, and she'll be chairing today's conversation as well as doing the intro. So I'm going to um, pass over to Nancy and I'm gonna launch the poll uh, as well. Nancy, the floor is yours. Over to me. Okay, thank you, Jackie, for that. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Nancy Doyle. I used to be the CEO of Genius Within, but I have handed it over to uh, the irrepressible Jackie Wallace um, so that we can all work at our best more of the time and I can geek out on my research. Um, I'm not dyslexic. I am ADHD. Um, and there's something lovely about this neurodiversity community of ours where we have different specialisms. And uh, when we work together, those specialisms um, can support a, a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And um, but uh, in terms of introducing an overview of dyslexia, dyslexia was actually the topic of my PhD. I was thinking it's a funny thing that goes on at the research centre at Birkbeck is that most of us are neurodivergent in some way, but we all seem to research different conditions. So we've recently had an autistic uh, PhD student graduate who researched the ADHD as me who's ADHD who's researched dyslexia. We now need a dyslexic to research autism um, or dyspraxia and then a dyspraxia to research, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll complete the circle. But it's about allyship, isn't it? It's about understanding that there are things that we all have to um, we all have to consider um, in this neurodiverse community. And it feels really lovely for me to focus on dyslexia this morning with you all, and or this afternoon rather, and to talk more to our lovely panel about their experiences of being dyslexic in the workplace. So um, we'll just give you a quick overview, Jackie, if you can go to that slide. Um, so I think, I, I mean, I don't know if I need to do any more about Genius Within. Um, We've got a little slide where I'll just give you a bit more of an overview in case you don't know um, about us. So we are a community interest company. Um, we're a neurodiversity specialist for in-work support, and we also provide um, out-of-work support. So we work with unemployed communities and people who are in prison. Um, we have a qualified team, um, a multidisciplinary team. Some of us are psychologists, some of us are coaches, some of us are um, mental health nurses, some of us are um, Sort of CIPD trained HR specialists um, and we're kind of you know very focused on careers and work and and how people can work at their best all of the time. Um, we are as you might have noticed from my preamble supporting the Centre for Neurodiversity Research at Work um, at the University of London um, which is where we're hoping to blend research and practice and try and kind of deal with the fact that a lot of research is not relevant to practice and is kind of a load of old nonsense and then you've got a lot of practice that is totally unsubstantiated and is based on what we think what we think it might work but we're not sure we spoke to a few people they said it was great and then we've taken that as read so what we're trying to do is is raise the bar on practice by raising the bar on research and um, in both the research center and the um and genius within we have got a majority disabled slash neurodivergent led leadership team um, and we're very much trying to live the kind of walking our own talk thing, which is that if we're going to advise on um, neuro inclusion, we need to be able to be neuro inclusive ourselves. Um, so it's really lovely for me today as an ADHD business starter, um, ADHD lending itself very well to starting things, entrepreneurialism, you know, making something out of nothing and then handing that over to Jackie as a dyslexic woman whose leadership skills have included um, taking many businesses through um, middle, middle growth 
um, into, um, into the mainstream and she has lots more experience of managing existing businesses. So I think we're, we're really owning the walking our own talk space at the moment, Jack. Yay us. Uh, the other thing about Genius Within is that we really pioneered the pos positive assessment approach. So when I was um, a trainee, a younger psychologist, uh, learning how to do dyslexia diagnoses, one of the things that really stuck out to me that I thought was really odd is, is why, when we have this condition that is absolutely characterised by having strengths and weaknesses, do we only talk about the weaknesses? So, you know, this was about <laughs> this was about 20 years ago that I was learning how to do diagnostics and it just really stuck out to me. I was like, well, hold on a second. So we do all these tests. And what we're looking for is for these specific things to be difficult and then the rest of these things to be doing really well. So, so, so why aren't we writing reports about the things that are happening really well, that are doing people do, are doing really well? And then um, when I was coaching, I got fed up with meeting coaching clients who did, had no idea of their strengths and no self-confidence to go with that. So and I would say, well, you know, have you got your dyslexia report? Can I have a little look at it? And I'd have a look at their dyslexia report and I'd find out that, you know, they were in the top 3% of the population for verbal skills. And I'd be like, oh, <laughs> you know how you're really good at talking people, talking to people when they're in distress? Yeah, that's because you're literally a genius at it. So, you know, we need to be talking about that when we write reports. Um, and so that kind of really bothered me. So I set up the positive assessment process. I've been working with the British Psychology for eight years to try and make all psychologists write reports like that it's a it's it's one of those um fourth bridge missions you know I get all the way across and then I have to go back and start again and then get all the way across and then go back and start again it might be my life mission um but it feels like the kind of hill I would die on because I think it's really important that we have a balanced approach it's not to undermine weaknesses and to say they don't exist but it is to and to acknowledge them and you know our struggles are real as neurodivergent people, but it's also to just have that balanced view. Um, so, and recent, more recently at Genius Within, we have launched the um, uh, Blooming Genius Foundation. So for years, people have saying to me, "When are you going to work with kids? When are you going to work with this kids?" <laughs> oh, that's very good. That's a good metaphor. I like that metaphor. We need some longer-lasting paint um, for the uh, positive assessment approach. Um, and, I, and I'm the answer is I'm not going to work with kids because I'm a workplace specialist and I don't think you should um, cross disciplinary work too much. But um, what we've decided to do is to support services for children with fundraising um, and genius within efforts. And at the moment, what we're doing is having a big scoping exercise to understand what provision is out there for children, what grassroots organisations exist. We don't want to take over. We don't want to you know, reinvent the wheel if people are already doing a really good job of certain things, but they just don't have the resources and don't have the voice. Well, then maybe we can give them the voice and the resources. You know, Jackie comes from the advertising media industry. She knows a lot about PR and giving voice to um, campaigns and missions. Um, we work with a lot of very, very big businesses that are currently profiting from the idea of neurodiversity. Let's get them to put their hands in their pockets and support the younger generation coming through. Let's support young people. So that's the mission of the Blooming Genius Foundation. If you want to have a little Google of it and contribute to our um, survey where we're surveying parents of SEN kids, young people um, with special educational needs and educators right now to say, what do you need? How can we support you? What do you want to have happen? Um, and that is our current plan. We, we, we have no fixed idea about what we'll do. We're waiting to be told, basically. And then we will, you can point the, fierce, the fierceness of, of the ADHD founder and uh, our Blooming Genius team, um, which is led by a, a young neurodiverse woman called Naz Seneglu. Um, and um, that will happen. So that's just a little bit of background about us. Um, so I'm going to talk you through, you know, the basics of dyslexia. I know some of you are here, you know, probably know all about this. Um, some of you are here, you are dyslexic. Some of you are here to be allies. So we're just going to do some very, very brief overviews and, and our take on dyslexia, just to orientate the talk, um, to stimulate a bit of discussion, to fill in any gaps for people who are new to this. Um, so, you know, a, a big picture thing to note is that 90% of disabilities are not visible. And um, so the idea of hidden disability um, is, is quite interesting because actually a lot of disability falls into that category. Um, and another example is that one in seven people have mental health needs in the uh, UK um, workforce at any one time. And so you've got this kind of big overlap of, of people with unspoken, hidden uh, differences 
where things that, that we need that will allow us to work at our best are not obvious. And it's not the same as kind of putting in wheelchair ramps or um, put intersectionality, absolutely, yeah. And it's not as obvious as putting in, um, you know, things to the built environment, although the built environment does make a difference. Um, and at the moment, that's costing the economy 10 to 6 billion pounds a year in, in lost productivity. Um, do you know what? I'm getting really distracted by the chat. ADHD brain is kicking in and I want to answer all your questions. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to stop. Someone sit on me. Jackie, feel free to wave at me if I'm going off track. Um, someone needs a whistle. <laughs> Betsy, get back on. Um, so, you know, dyslexia fits into this broad category of, of neuro minority conditions, or you might say neurodivergence, or you might say neurotypes, uh, different neurotypes. You know, we talk about dyslexia, we talk about ADHD, we talk about dyspraxia, uh, dyscalculia, um, autism. Um, we can include mental health in that um, kind of list of, of, of minority neurotypes. Uh, we can also include acquired neurodiverse conditions, which is where people um, have different compromises to their neurocognitive functioning based on experiences they've had, such as brain injury or uh, illnesses. And uh, we also, we really like to include Tourette syndrome in this as well. And I'm always trying to promote Tourette syndrome because it's, it, it is as common as autism. Do you know that? As common as autism, but has 2% uh, um, of the amount of research to, compared to autism. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, as a, any, anyway, we won't, we won't di digress there. So dyslexia, I think it's really important to contextualize dyslexia as a symptom, not a cause. Um, when I started uh, my PhD, I, I kept thinking to myself, there must be some tranche of literature somewhere. There must be some tranche of knowledge, which is really going to explain to me what this is. Because I've been doing these diagnoses and I've been working with people. And, you know, you've got all these different things. You've got people talking about, thank you for your turn. My pleasure, Toretta's, my pleasure. Um, distraction again. Ah! Um, uh, you've got all these different theories, you know, dyslexia is caused by difficulty with sound. Some people think it's caused by difficulty recognizing whole words. Other people are talking about the transition from the short term memory to the long term memory. You know, there's all these different things and all these different styles and all these different ways in which dyslexia can present itself. And, um, and I just think, you know, actually what we've got to remember is that it's there are so many different parts of the brain involved in reading and writing that it, it would actually be weird if it was one spot. Do you know, like if we could find, if we did a neuro, some neurological brain scanning and we found the one bit of the brain that was responsible for dyslexia, that would be weird because dyslexia is a complex adaptive skill. It's not something we were evolved to do. It requires, it relies on lots of different parts of the brain and it relies on the interaction between our neurological profile and the language we speak. So one of the most interesting things I found out um, when I was when I was doing my early research and my early literature reviews is that if you scan the brains of dyslexic Chinese people, they are completely different in profile to the brains of, of dyslexic um, uh, English people because Chinese is not a phonological language. It doesn't require, require you to process sound. It requires you to process image. So, you know, it's perfectly possible that Chinese people wouldn't be dyslexic if they were English. Chinese dyslexics wouldn't be dyslexic if they were speaking English. And English dyslexics might not be dyslexic if they were speaking Chinese. So you've just got this wonderful interaction between these diverse brains where you've got this pattern of strengths and weaknesses and you know where those strengths and weaknesses lie interact with the environment around us. And that's what determines whether or not we're in our element or, or not in our element. Okay, so, and, and the point that I wanna make there as well about literacy, the other thing that I think really stands out to me about dyslexia is that, you know, I, I once wrote a blog post and I can't find it. It was years ago, it was right back at the beginning of my um, professional career. And my blog post was, reading is a transition technology discuss you know because it was only around 150 years ago that we decided that reading was the route to success so what's that all about you know if if 10 percent of the population find it hard at what point is that a problem in terms of the human species as a whole you know like don't you think it's a bit weird 
that the only way that you get to be in a career or at university is if you can sit still and process 2D sequential code um, in black and white. Like that's not very normal, is it? You know what I mean? If you think about humans and we're used to seeing like the natural world and animals and things that move and each other and hearing stories and learning by stories and learning by dance and communicating messages through the arts. And then all of a sudden, everything is broken into this 2D sequential code that we have to process in order to be a surgeon or an engineer or a hairdresser or a bricklayer. Like, what? <laughs> I just, you know, like, I just think it's really, really odd. It's kind of nonsense. Um, and so actually, what we have to be thinking about with dyslexia is not necessarily a symptom, which is the literacy. And let's face it, we've all got these now. You know, when I'm talking about reading being a transition technology, I'm thinking about my phone that I can point at things. And if I've got Microsoft Seeing Eye app, it will read anything I point it at. I'm thinking about how easily I can start talking at my Alexa over there, who's probably going to hear me and start talking back to me now. Don't do that, Alexa. Um, you know, and, and Alexa can write things for me when I talk to her. Um, and, but, you know, when I got into dyslexia support in the um, early 2000s, you know, drag and dictate was a clunky old tool. I don't know if any of you've been around long enough to, um, to, to remember that, but these days it will happily process a Glaswegian, a thick Glaswegian accent. Um, and it's just, you know, the technology that we're using has really made literacy obsolete. I don't think we should be spending 12 years of education teaching it anymore. I think we should notice who loves it and let those people get really into it. And for people who are struggling, we should just be handing out the technology and letting them focus on the things they enjoy. Um, because the, the school system no longer rep represents the modern workplace. So, so let's just whiz through a few things now. I think I've done my... Um, uh, so. You know, in general, we're talking about specialist thinking rather than generalist thinking. And we know that typically the skills that go with dyslexia can be verbal skills. It can be storytelling um, and poetry and singing and music. It can be um, visual spatial reasoning and mechanical reasoning. And, um, you know, those of us that can put together IKEA flat pack furniture versus those who can't, you know, we all need to work together, chaps. We all do. Um, and we know that working memory can be a particular issue for uh, dyslexia as it can for ADHD and we know that some dyslexics find processing word hard and it's not always verbal skills um, but what we do know is that there's this balanced picture of strengths and weaknesses so moving on to the workplace um, in the workplace our research shows that that um, results in the following kind of coaching goals so people that come to us for coaching <laughs> Simon I'm laughing um my mum can't do that she calls the instructions the destructions have you read the destructions she says um uh so yeah 92 percent of, uh, of our coaching clients come with um goals around memory and concentration 83 percent around organizational skills 78 percent around time management and 67 percent around communication so literacy isn't the predominant complaint for dyslexics once you get once we get into the workplace you know we've got more things we can do to overcome that and so we also have done a lot of research around what works we know that providing executive functions coaching you know around those those topics like memory and concentration um we know that that works we know with literacy coaching that rather than kind of trying to um, you know, do in, in, in four coaching sessions what 12 years of education um, failed to achieve. We know that what we can do with literacy coaching is, is much more about adaptation and, and kind of how, do you, how are you going to manage this literacy component of your job rather than trying to teach adults to read and write. Um, and uh, we do do things like teach speed reading and stuff like that, but generally speaking, um, that is much more about in context and adaptive because assistive technology is getting there and it's so good now compared to how it was. We also know that workstation adaptions work, lots of dyslexic people like dual screens um, to reduce working memory load. Um, we know that schedule flexibility is, is a real um, bonus and kind of being able to work in quiet times of day where you're not distracted, distracted like I am right now with Barbara's diagnoses, <laughs> lots of overlapping uh, things there. We know that supervisor input makes a difference as a reasonable adjustment. Lots of supervisors are amazingly supportive and can get wonderful results working 
um, working by giving people the benefit of the doubt and reinforcing strengths rather than weaknesses and being supportive. Um, and we know that dyslexic people need uh, adaptions to formal training. So for example, having um, any reading requirements in advance, making sure reading requirements are compatible with assistive technology. Um, and we know that environmental flexibility makes a difference. So being in the middle of an open plan office is pants. Uh, we know that. <laughs> and that's true for lots of neurodivergent people. That's not just dyslexics. Um, and so when we put these adjustments in place, the other thing that our research has shown is that uh, we get a 75% improvement in self-rated performance. So how people are rating themselves in memory, time, organisation, communication before they start a coaching intervention or before they have uh, reasonable adjustments in the workplace is an average of about four out of 10. And then by the time they've finished, it's an average of about seven, about, about seven out of 10. And when we get their managers to rate them the same, you know, before and after, how are they now? How are they doing? We get a 47% improvement in productivity. And that's not because people are improving less. So that usually goes from about five out of 10 to about seven out of 10. And what you'll notice is the difference is in the before score, not the after score. So after, so after adjustments in place, managers and clients are, are, managers and employees are rated themselves around the same in terms of performance. It's, a, a bit, it's in a good place. It's seven out of 10 on average. That it's much better than it was. But what we noticed is the managers were rating them higher to begin with. Um, and I think there's two reasons for that, which I'd like to explore further one day. One is um, that uh, dyslexic people, neurodivergent people have a tendency to underrate their own performance. So we're, we're a bit down on ourselves. We'll, we'll give ourselves a bit of a harder time than other people will give us. Um, and then the other thing is that some managers don't see how hard we're working to keep up. And so there's a bit of that swan thing, you know, where we look like we're gliding across the water, but actually we're paddling like crazy underneath and maybe our managers haven't seen that they're not they didn't they don't know how how hard we're working um something we're really proud of at genius within is that within a year of receiving adjustments that we've recommended or delivered um 25 of our clients are promoted and that is i think absolutely that where we should all be aiming for because what that means is that people that get the right support are able to work more at the power of their strengths top of that spiky profile they're doing that stuff and those things that they're struggling with, the peak, the, the, the troughs of the spiky profile have been supported and taken care of in the right way. Um, and we also have a 95% job retention rate across all of our projects. And that includes um, people who were long term unemployed before they worked with us and people who were incarcerated before they worked with us. Um, and that's really unusual for the wide sector that we work with. Um, and it's something we're really proud of because we're not encouraging people to stay or go into jobs that don't suit them. So that 5% who leave tend to be coaching clients and they tend to be leaving because actually through the coaching, what they've realized is they're in the wrong job and it doesn't suit them. And what they'd rather do is something else. And that's a good outcome. So, you know, if we had a hundred percent job at retention rate, I'd be a bit worried. That would feel like forcing people to stick doing something that doesn't quite work. So that's my kind of blurb about dyslexia. I hope that didn't go on too long. It went on a little bit long. I think I've overshot by a couple of minutes. I'm very sorry. Um, but I think now the best thing to do is to hand over to um, the irrepressible Jackie and her irrepressible panel of irrepressible dyslexic um, female leaders who have... Um, who have kind of come to, to share their experience with us, which would be lovely. So um, I, I haven't got a list of who, any order that I'm supposed to, to invite people into, but I know that Marcia won't mind me putting her on the spot. So um, Marcia, do you mind if I come to you first? Um, and we're gonna start with, um, so we've got three questions to ask the panel. Um, and um, the first one is about kind of, you know, how dyslexia is for you personally. So bear in mind that spiky profile, bearing in mind there's lots of different types of dyslexia. What's your experience of being a dyslexic? So Marcia? yeah, hi everybody. So I'm Marcia and I wanna say first, I'm gonna just put a disclaimer. I've had to hack the system. 
okay because the system you know I loved school I loved education but it didn't feel like it loved me back and I was told I had to go to school um and my disability is because the systems crippled me basically to be able to really reach my potential and um, I know that because I came out with G one GCSE a grade B in drama so if I'm taking that into, co into context I feel that there's been lots of failures and my gifts and talents that I've had to nurture in my own kind of head and do lots of daydreaming, be creative in my thinking and think outside the box has been because of my own doing and my own resilience. Um, I feel that for far too long, and I see it now because I do work in education, um, there's this whole sense of belonging and that, you know, I, I saw someone talk about intersectionality and I feel that the, there's, there's some real good factors that and what may have impacted on my kind of experience is around my race, you know, class, education, my environment. I'm definitely quite sure about that. And I feel some of those failures were some of those intersections that played a part. Um, and then, you know, I just decided to selectively mute and not engage. So I've been on a journey and there has been traumas which started from primary school, um, but I, I do see the gifts now and I do see them, but I've had to hack the system in order to um, bypass the hurdles. Um, and it's not been easy. I still get triggers from those experiences, but I'm more in a positive place. So my dyslexia has been, yeah, I've learned to, had to learn to know who I am and learn my strengths and learn how to navigate in a society that doesn't really play the social model. I do feel that the school, and I think you mentioned something about the education system. I feel that we're still in the industrial age and I feel no. that we're, 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 we're preparing people for the, the um, factories that don't exist. And we're not up to date, whether it's in schools, whether it's in the higher education sector, we need to look at how we can engage different learners and how, mm -hmm. what that looks like. You know, I do like a sing and dance. I do like that, Nancy, thanks so much, because you mentioned that and I do like to talk. And some of those things, can, why can't we do an essay in a talk form? Why not? Why not? I can yeah. have it all there. Why not can I have not have my interview notes well ahead of time so I don't feel anxious? So those are some of the in the things that I feel about my dyslexia. I'm learning to love myself more and be more from a celebratory model um, in terms of who I am and my neurodiversity and about representation as well, which is really important to me because we don't talk enough about those intersections and class no. and the environment to why we don't get the same opportunities, which is why I feel I was failed. I hope that answers mm -hmm. enough. I, I think that does. And I think it's I think it's a really important rate point to raise. You know, uh, dyslexic experience is not the same across different intersections. And it's one of the reasons that we've got this panel here today talking about those. I've just popped a link in the chat, actually, to a fantastic article in The Times today about a school who are doing things differently. And I recommend you have a read of that, even if you have to sign up as a subscriber to The Times, the article's worth it. So, Kim To, could I just inter um, ask you to just sort of introduce yourself and say for you dyslexia is like what yeah sure hi everyone my name is kim to so i am a tech entrepreneur and what that means is i'm looking at how technology such as ai can be used to help the neurodiverse community um i just feel i mean i'm I love technology. I'm really into it. It helps with my neurodiversity, but I just feel like there's still a really under, I guess the neurodiverse community is very underserved in the technology world. And that's not surprising considering like the venture capital world, only 1% of funding goes to women, even less for women of color and even less for disabled or neurodiverse mm. people. So huge advocate for that. Uh, and I'm working on ideas myself. Um, so, and I'm also trained to be an ADHD coach. So I was diagnosed with dyslexia at university actually. So maybe 10 years ago now. And I was diagnosed with ADHD actually last year because of the pandemic. And when I was working from home, it drove me crazy. Mm. So now I'm training to be an ADHD coach. So in terms of how dyslexia manifests for me, I really noticed it at university when I just couldn't consume a huge amount of text and summarize it. I also was terrible with names. So I remember going to university, everyone telling me their names and I'd be like, I just can't remember anyone's names. I felt incredibly rude. So I can't remember people's name and my name is so short and people remembered mine and just felt like I was like the most stupid person in that university. Um, but, um, 
that, sorry, there are other things as well. I, I realize that my semantic memory is really good. So that means I'm able to literally remember how I, I met people for the first time, what they told me. And what that means is I consume, uh, I'm not good at memorization, but my long-term memory is damn good if it means something to me and if I add a lot of meaning to it. So um, of course it's, it's all invisible. And um, since we're talking about race, I can put that in and that it makes me feel stupid because being Asian, I have a lot of, you know, being the first born to um, Vietnamese refugees, uh, I had a lot of pressure to do well at university. So doing arts, creative stuff, which I was very creative, it just wasn't an option for me. Um, and, you know, really working hard and, you know, oops, sorry, <laughs> the light's gone out. Um, mm. Sorry, give me one second. Plunged into darkness there. <laughs> yeah. In the um, middle of what was a lovely flow. There dramatic, you are, you're back, back in the room. Dramatic. Um, but essentially what it makes me feel is, you know, I just felt really stupid in my, you know, just with my age and background and not doing quite well at university because of my dyslexia, it really hit for me really hard because I didn't want to disappoint my family and I've had to change that narrative in order to be happy with who I am um, and it took a while for my family to understand that dyslexia has nothing to do with my intelligence because I'm very intelligent so um, so yeah that's a bit about me I just want to make sure there's enough time for everybody else. Thank you so much for sharing Kim and I think there's a theme isn't there about kind of that that sense that that people can do things that we can't do and therefore we're lacking and not having that recognized early and therefore kind of absorbing that into our sense of self and our identities so um Annabelle and Remy Ray um I, I'm going to come to Remy Ray next because I don't know Remy Ray so I'm excited and sorry Annabelle but you know I'm ADHD and I like novelty and I know you <laughs> so if I can come to Remy next and just say hi Remy can you share your experience being um, dyslexic for you is like what? Yeah so I got diagnosed at the age of 19 um, at university after struggling immensely all through school in every capacity I also left with very few, few grades I had to retake everything and I felt really rejected and so I I thought for a long time I was an entrepreneur just naturally it's innate it's in me it's who I am but the reality is is that I used my entrepreneurial outlet as survival because I felt rejected by the same system that was supposed to help me create this livelihood for myself, be able to support myself and progress me in some way in a workplace. And I just felt rejected consistently. Um, I've done everything scared as well. I started my um, entrepreneurial journey from the age of 13 um, because I really needed an outlet. I come from a Caribbean background, um, and as long as you can talk, right, nothing's wrong with you. You're not stupid. And so people didn't really believe that there was ever anything wrong with my memory because I could articulate myself well. And I just always felt very different. I felt, I, I, I feel as though I felt different from as early as like nursery, you know, standing in the playground, um, looking around at things in a, quite a different way and people thinking you know what's wrong with this person and then through to primary school where memory is a big thing and then into like secondary school where you need to use your memory more um I just felt consistently rejected and it didn't change when I entered the workplace either um applications being rejected because I'm not spelling things correctly um having to lean on my friends and family all the time for extra support in every capacity from CVs to dissertations um, and just always being in need of somebody else to help you um, be able to, to live, right? Um, so I've consistently felt rejected, but um, I guess my experiences is that I've done everything scared and I've built up almost like a false sense of confidence and somehow I've fooled myself now and I feel quite confident in my abilities. So yeah, rejection. Well, I'm glad to hear that you feel quite confident in your abilities, Remy. And there's a real um, entrepreneurial, you know, business leading theme that comes out of both ADHD and dyslexia. Um, some really early research um, 13 years ago now from Julie Logan at the Cass Business School found out that 35% of um, US entrepreneurs are, are dyslexic compared to 1% of corporate managers. 
um, compared to 10% in the population. So we've got this underrepresentation of, of dyslexic creativity kind of going through the corporate machine and people like yourself who are irrepressible. I keep using that word because I love it. It's my word du jour. But that's how I feel as part of the neurodiverse community. You know, it's this irrepressibility, isn't it? This kind of, okay, I feel ground down, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. And that kind of that kind of resilience that pushes us through. So yeah, both um, you know, lots of lots of entrepreneurial flair. So over to Annabelle. Um, thank you for joining us, Annabelle, another irrepressible dyslexic um brain tell us about yourself and uh your your experience of dyslexia so i guess i guess it's kind of it mirrors a lot of what everyone else has said like kim said i've got horrible working memory and there's that meme that kind of went around a little while ago about kind of someone being given a name on a plate and the guy throwing it away because they forget the name immediately that's me the only reason why i've remembered kim's name is because it's in front of me on the screen and i could cheat and uh, and remember so totally get kind of that side of things you know Marty had talked about um intersectionality and um kind of the that sort of alienation and rejection at school kind of ticking a couple of LGBT boxes kind of definitely kind of had a similar experience to me and kind of I was always that kind of what if kid you know I'd always put my hand up in history class and be like what if the Romans hadn't invaded or what if kind of that didn't work like this and my teachers would be like will you stop asking what if questions because what <laughs> if never happened I'm like yeah, yeah yeah but I kind of want to understand the context around mm. those events I want to understand the situation and kind of in a more kind of adult working world the thing I kind of keep hearing that kind of drives me crazy from people is will you stop overthinking everything? Kind of you jumping ahead sort of 10 steps or you go into the worst case scenario. I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to the worst case scenario so I can also go to the best case scenario so I can bound the kind of challenge that we're facing and then I can kind of work out what the different kind of pieces are in between. But I mean, kind of, I mean, I wasn't, my, my school experience was, was fairly kind of challenging and like one, one, a level I was bottom set for maths for a reasonable amount of the time and I remember when I got the GCSE results everyone was kind of really confused because I got an A on the physics paper and I got an E on my on my GCSE maths and everyone was like that doesn't make any sense how does that how does that kind of go kind of go together and you know um <laughs> I remember one of my English teachers sort of said to me um I think he might be dyslexic this was this was about 14 13 14 and she said, you know, I want to I kind of get, get you kind of checked out. I was like, okay, fine, fair enough, awesome. And she gave me a spelling test of 20 words. And basically I got one more correct than I had to, to kind of go on to do the proper assessment. And so kind of, they were just like, oh, well, you're not dyslexic, you're just kind of really bad speller and you're just kind of really difficult at school. And I was like, awesome. That's, that's exactly kind of, that's exactly me. And so kind of, it then became this whole thing with my parents about being the difficult child. And I've always got lots of questions and nothing's ever good enough because I always want to know more and blah, 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 blah. And it wasn't until I got to my first year at uni where um, I was studying psychology and I, I was fortunate enough to have one of those kind of really old professors who was, you know, semi-retired and he'd done everything in clinical practice and you know it done it, it's it, it's still there kind of talking about you know attachment theory and you go okay awesome and then suddenly you talk about how he was in a lab in, in a in a surgery one time and so a lobotomizing somebody I'm like wow okay and I handed him my first essay and he pulled me to one side afterwards he went oh, I think he might be dyslexic and um, got me through for a kind of proper kind of proper test um but kind of like like what you were saying earlier Nancy it kind of wasn't kind of strengths based it was very much you're really bad at these things and you're really dyslexic and that really sucks to be you and I was like awesome tell me something I don't know <laughs> and you know kind of you know there was some support around that and you know I got through uni but it wasn't then until I kind of got kind of reassessed through GW um um, and there's a long kind of story about that. And there's been lots of exciting things with my mental health that have kind of fallen out of the kind of LGBT and the rejection and the dyslexia and the rejection and, and, and all that sort of stuff that I kind of went, hang on a second, actually, I am a big picture thinker. Actually, I think through processes really, really well, because that binding that I put on the kind of worst case scenario and the best case scenario kind of then, and, and you know, that, that kind of, 
hey, actually, I'm not overthinking. The other people in the room are underthinking. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, guys, but if you can't keep up, then that's kind of your problem, kind of. But then that's frustration for me, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's me. And memory, working memory. Yeah. Ah, oh, ye oldie working memory. Yeah. Yes, it's a continual don't, don't set theme. Me, don't set me, you know, numerical mathematical reasoning tests. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I mean, and also the pointless, if I want to kind of work out the average kind of rainfall of Venezuela and how that impacts upon China's GDP as a percentage of oil exports or something, I'm going to use Excel to kind of work that one out with formulas to very much. Which I might know might be the kind of thing Annabelle does need to do in, in her daily living. So, <laughs> that's not a randomly selected fact. <laughs> and I yeah, I, I think it's I, I think it's lovely what you said about what if questions, Annabelle. And I saw so much nodding from the people that have got their cameras on right now. It was like literally an episode of the Muppets. We were all going, Yes, it was it was, you know, it was <laughs> it was just great. But um, you know, it, it is it is that that makes it possible for for us to to push the boundaries. There's a lovely quote by George Bernard Shaw that says, "The reasonable man um, fits himself to the to, to the world around him, and the unreasonable man requires the world to change to to fit for him to fit into, and therefore all human progress is down to the unreasonable man." And um, yes, it's a bit old fashioned with its gendering and what have you. But I just think it's a, a, a lovely quote. You know, you don't we don't push boundaries without those what if questions. Yes, it is annoying, but it is also how we um, how we make progress. So, Jackie, back to you. And I'm just thinking, you know, we've got um, we've got kind of 15 minutes left and I've got the, the what works for us question. So I don't know if you want to segue into that as well, yeah. because I know part yeah. of your dyslexic experience of late has been truly finding out things, you know, that can support you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and I identify very um, strongly with um, diagnosis happening at um, university. That's where I got my diagnosis. And Remy, what you were saying there was just totally my experience relying on my very good friend to basically edit all of my degree papers before they got handed in because it was all there, but it was all in the wrong order. Um, so, um, but and then having to segue out and transition from university into the world of work and I think someone's just written their, their workplace made them feel like a 10 year old and that kind of minimizing of your experience as an adult in the working environment is very damaging and um we often mask and I did for 25 years and had a very senior job in a um global advertising agency flying all over the world speaking to huge brands and never ever disclosed that I had dyslexia I'd invent all kinds of amazing twisty turny reasons why I couldn't stand up in the front of the room and take notes on the board or, or do any writing down um, because you know it's pretty good for your experience I mean I know how to do this but you should do it definitely because if I got a, if I just panic and it would make it all worse um, but now at work what I've discovered is that one I'm in an amazing I'm very lucky to be in an amazing environment that basically uh, when I said finally gathered my courage up to say I was dyslexic they went oh brilliant you're probably an amazing creative thinker yes <laughs> and uh, that's never happened before so um, that was a, a really exciting and novel experience and then um, working out that you can advocate for yourself and that if you can't do something there are things around that can help you and people have talked about dragon in the chat and um, it has moved on it's just been bought by microsoft okay. uh, you can train your dragon now um, so you know you can teach it to say words that you say very frequently um, so like genius within has to be written two words and capitalized so it, it knows to write that properly um, but even if you can't get that, the accessibility tab in Microsoft 365 is amazing. It has speech to write and read. You can change the um, speed at which it reads back to you. Um, and I think there's two voices now. I think there needs to be one. Um, and, and knowing what I have to do to work at my best. So I work in, so my dyslexia is more auditory than visual. Um, in terms of reading. So I've taught myself literacy over the years by repeat. We, Nancy and I were talking about this yesterday. 
I, you know, I can spell if I've seen it before, but with names, if I've not seen someone's name before and I, anywhere else, I can't say it. I have to have them say it to me lots of times for me to remember. Um, but I do work in colour for when I write things down. So my book is covered in notes. I've got a pencil case. It's got 17 different coloured biros in it. Um, my auditory dyslexia is really poor so my I can't learn I, I find it very hard to learn a foreign language I can't learn a foreign language I've tried and tried and tried I'd love to learn a foreign language I'd love to be able to play a musical instrument I am actually tone deaf so it is the auditory aspect for me in that part of my brain um it is is really it really struggles and so you know actually my days of, of wanting to be a concert pianist, I think, are, are over and I have to give that dream up and uh, think of another one. But um, advocating for yourself and what works best and, and finding those little workarounds is not cheating. Who said cheating? Annabelle, you said cheating earlier. It's not cheating. It's Master finding... said hacking. Yeah, hacking. and it feels like that, doesn't it? It, does. it feels like cheating and hacking, but it's it's not. We, you know, because mm. actually the thing that we find easiest, the thing that I can do easily someone else will quake in their boots over so this I can do Marcia can chat all day we've spoken before Annabelle can Remy and Kim Jackie I makes all our slides well. look at look at those lovely slides you saw earlier she can she can do that in her sleep whilst watching telly and drinking a glass of wine at 10 o'clock at night I know true. this to be true because I've given her a last minute job on occasion and it's been very amazing like the um the elves and the shoemaker you go to bed thinking you've got handed her a task and then when you wake up in the morning it's all beautiful so let's um let's just have some final words from um our panel who have been just so amazing in sharing um their stories and just giving everyone something to relate to which is so important when you felt like the odd one out um for those formative years to just find your tribe and to find this kind of connection with, with others so if i can come back round to you one one at a time and just you know, a couple of words on what works for you. What are what are your best hacks? And they're not cheats. They're, they're the things that work for you. But, you, you know, what, what are your best hacks that really make a difference for you in the workplace? So Marcia. I'm, I'm definitely an ideas person. And I'm a person who sees the end before the beginning. So I'm right. I'm in the meeting. It's like, yeah, I can see it. And then everyone's not with me. And then I have to go back because I'm, I get very enthusiastic. You might notice that in my talking, I'm really happy about things, especially when I'm hyper-focused and really interested. Um, that has actually caused me some issues around people feeling belonging. Some staff have excluded me because I'm bringing another idea. Oh no, it's Marcia again, another idea. So sometimes I do think I'm in the place where I need to be more in a creative place where ideas are encouraged and nurtured because I, I am an ideas person. And I think there's something just to have if I don't speak again for today, because I know that we've limited time. There's something about seeing things in pictures, you know, and um, Thomas West talks about this. And when I was doing my, my MA around this, I was just like, this is me, the higher level thinking. There's lower level thinking around rope learning, you know, retaining information. That's the low level thinking. But the high level thinking is seeing patterns and being able to visualize and contextualize. And that's me all the time, every day, all day. Um, and I, I realized I like to do blogging because I really like the visual. I like to have that provoking impact. So I'm, I'm learning my ways and how I move and vibrate in the world. And I'm, I'm loving that about my discovery of myself. So playing to your strengths, knowing what you do well and doing those things. Lovely. OK, so over to Kim. Kim, what's the most important thing for you to work at your best? Yeah, so... For me, it's flexibility and just understanding. Like I tell everyone from day one now that I have dyslexia and ADHD and it's like, if they've got any questions, I'll answer it that. So it creates a safe space for me. And the other thing is, if you're gonna send me an email at the top, highlight what you want me to do. I don't want any fluffy description. You know, how are you? Okay, yeah, I'm good. Just tell me exactly <laughs> what you need me to do and put that at the top. So I know what the action is for, my, for emails because I hate emails. We're not moving away from them anytime soon. So I ask everyone to do that for me. That seems like a perfectly reasonable accommodation and actually just really good practice. I think, it, it, and people, um, I hear this all the time when you put in place some neuro inclusive practice, like, you know, uh, an email where at the top of it says, Kim, this is just FYI, no, inf no action, or Jackie, could you please read to the bottom of this because there's something I need you to do by Friday. Do you know that that sort of thing? Every it's like everyone in the in the company goes, oh my god, it's Kim. 
<laughs> so yeah, we will teach them. We will teach people how to how to communicate in a in a more um, neuro inclusive style. So thank you, Kim, for sharing. And and Remy, for you, yeah. what really works supporting you to work at your best? So I've got a few things here. I'll be quick. Um, so in my signature, I actually add that I'm refreshingly dyslexic. So if somebody wants to skim over that, that's on them. But I let you know in advance that I am dyslexic. It's in my signature. You can't miss it. Um, and I also tell people how best to work with me because in meetings, you know, some people are like, this needs to be done and that needs to be done. And, and it just goes in and out and that's not the best way to work with me so if you want me to do something then you need to follow up with an email and like you said you know give me the actions what needs to be done here and there um alarms i set alarms for everything i'm usually early because i set alarms a minimum of half an hour to 15 minutes before i need to be somewhere um or you know i just allow myself the room to get set up because otherwise i'll get flustered and the last one is doing it scared i think the conversation now is open around um, dyslexia and neurodiversity, but we need to take, even if it's brave action, it just has to be had. We can no longer afford to hide in the shadows um, and play small because we're really needed. We are probably going to contribute to the true sustainable change of this world and we can't afford to hide in the shadows anymore. Mic drop. <laughs> total, total mic drop. Don't ask um, me to go next. Don't ask me to go next. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. No hiding in the shadows. Although, although, though ironically, the light is a bit funny and you keep going into the shadows there, Remy. That's really funny. Um, so, Annabelle. Um, so, I guess similar to what people have said already, you kind of, if you want me to do something, just write it down because it's going to, in a meeting, that's awesome, and I love the conversation, but it's going to go in that ear and out that ear, and I'm going to leave that room and go, what am I supposed to be doing again? Um, but kind of from a from a kind of simple, practical kind of day-to-day -day thing, that dual screen, because I obviously, as you know, Nancy, spent a lot of my time doing research, and so um, having having kind of two screens um, where I can, I can work from is really handy. I'm always, I need a notepad for everything. I've got a notepad here even for this that you can't quite see to the background but everything I just pictures I draw everything and um I work best where I've got a problem to solve or a strategy to work on and everything else to me is kind of well boring and dull give me a problem that no one else can fix and a strategy that you need to come up with and I'm all over that like rash mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know I think as a as someone who has managed teams um and neurodiverse teams I think it's really lovely when your employees can say to you what they need. You know, sometimes one of the most essential things that comes out of a coaching programme is the employee finding the words and the, 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 the kind of style of how you advocate for those things. So when you know that you need things written down and when you've lost that self-blame for it and you're not thinking of that as something you need to be ashamed about and something you can just ask for, and then you just ask your manager, um, can you can we make sure that we make notes of this meeting or can I just write them if you're hold on you're talking too quick I need to write these down or I need to you need to record them into my phone or something because I'm going to lose it that self-awareness is a really lovely trait in a in an employee and it makes for really um really good working relationships and it's you know it's lovely when people come back from coaching and they can they can kind of have those conversations with you so from the other side of this as someone who manages teams I'd just like to really support what Remy and Annabelle have just said there um, so Jackie, last word, lady. We're at last words. Stage, I'm unmuting myself. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I think honesty. I mean, Remy, what that was fantastic. Nearly swore then. That was fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Well, and I think um, the honesty and the transparency of of owning. And I think that I know we had a, a conversation on. Um, LinkedIn yesterday about commentary and I think that um, it is very hard when you have something that is invisible and it doesn't always disable me and I don't feel disabled and sometimes that feels like a lie and uh, minimizing a physical disability person's experience but what I will say is environments disable me mm. and 
when I am in an environment that disables me, that brings shame on me. And that shame makes me turn away from things and, and it gives me stress. And then stress gives me mental health issues. And if we can have honesty and transparency right up at the top of this and have acceptance and know what our strengths are and bring those to the, the party, then the, the um, long tail effect that hidden disability can have negatively on us can disappear. Businesses um, get a huge amount of benefit from different cognitive minds. If they didn't, GCH, GCHQ wouldn't be hiring them. The British government wouldn't be looking for people who are dyslexic. The ability to think in 3D and creatively is a huge talent. And just because I'm not very good at note taking in a meeting doesn't mean I should be overlooked. And Nancy is very good at note taking and loves to do it with her ADHD brain. So we are like win win. On it. It's the only way I can. It's the only way I can listen. If I, I need to have two things to do, I can't listen and not move. I have to be moving at the same time. So I'm actually really good at taking notes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, good, good combo, good combo, very good um, combination. Yeah, and then we've got the lovely Fiona, um, who is who, our steady rock. Steady rock, yeah. So I think there's just more about this, isn't there? The complementary teams, the blend of specialists where we don't have to be embarrassed about the things that we can't do because we're working with people who can do those things and love to do those things. And then no one has to feel ashamed or afraid and everyone can just get on with doing what they uniquely do, which is Jackie's phrase that I love. Everyone should be doing what they uniquely do first and that should be the mainstay of their job. And that's been another theme coming out of this discussion, listening to Kind of the, the the entrepreneurial flair um you know the tech focused and the creativity in tech and the problem solving focus um and the supporting education focus you know we, we're we're going into the areas where we feel passionate and we're doing the things that we can uniquely do in those areas and then that's having that's allowing us to be working at the power of our strengths um, which is actually super inspiring for the next generation. And we need to remember that, you know, so I think there's quite a few Gen X women in this panel. Um, maybe a millennial. Kim, are you a millennial? I think you may be a, a, a millennial. millennial. A millennial. Yeah. All right. We've allowed a token millennial. Remy, are you a millennial? You might also be a millennial. Yeah. OK, so we've got some token millennials in with the Gen X women. But, you know, our experiences in education do not have to be the same as Gen Z and Gen Alpha. We can change things for the next generations coming up. Um, amazing. So thank you, everyone, for listening and um, for being part of this. I saw a question about um, uh, will there be a video and transcript available of this talk? Um, yes is the is the answer to that so yeah that will come out in the fullness of time as quickly as it can be made to happen um thank you so much to our panel it's just been great to to meet and um hear about the awesome things that you guys are doing if you don't know the work of, of these women i do really encourage you to google them and linkedin them um and and just find out a bit more about what they're up to because it is it is proper proper inspirational stuff